Hey there, interweb heads. My name is Mark, and I like to talk about in this video is immersion in video games. By immersion, I mean the act of becoming enthralled within a video game or any other type of media. The driving force that makes you want to continue the game. What makes you feel like you're a part of the world. And what makes you care about the situation and the people within that world. If done well, you can feel like you're not even playing a game, or well, watching a movie, or reading a book. Of course, that can be dangerous. Some people forget that they have a life and priorities to tend to. Now, video games are a special type of media, mostly for the amount of interactivity needed to progress through. Just about anyone can pick up a book and read it. Well, it depends on if you're literate or not. People with a wider vocabulary could get a greater enjoyment out of a book, but you don't really need a wider vocabulary to progress through. If you get stuck on a word in the book, the book isn't going to stop you and then send you right back to the last chapter. You can just ignore it and keep going, like it wasn't even there. Same thing with a movie or show. You're not required to interact with the TV to get your favorite show. To continue, you just need to sit there and enjoy it. This is not the case for video games. Most video games require you to have constant interaction at all times just to continue. They may provide information within cutscenes which is usually just a dialogue between your character and a different character within the story. And they're usually just to further the story. Or maybe just uh, to entertain, give you something uh, fun to look at. Though nowadays, quick time events, also known as QTEs, have become the norm within cutscenes to give the player just that little bit more interactivity throughout the game. QTEs are a little weird. Um, their purpose in games seem to uh, shift time to time, and a lot of people view them a little differently. You could actually hinder immersion, or they could help, but I'll cover that later. Other things that seem to break immersion is stuff like invisible walls, items in where places, the game controls, and objects that are ordinary life but don't have the same properties within the video game. By that, I mean situations where your character needs to get in a room with a locked wooden door. Not only do you have a weapon that could break and shatter the door, you may have seen in a previous cutscene a different character use a lesser weapon to break open a different but similar door. It's something I believe I'm going to have to cover in a lot of the videos I'm doing. And probably more detail, but you'll get the gist. It's important to remember that things that do break immersion in video games aren't usually there to do that, to break immersion. They're usually there because there's really no other way around it. The technology might not exist at the time, or it's part of the story. Or maybe it's just overlooked. Now, while I don't really focus on graphics in games unless they're so bad I can't understand what's going on, I do believe that graphics can help tremendously immerse a person within a game. I do believe that there are drawbacks, though, to having more realistic graphics in video games. Now, a part of that's special about video games are glitches. Glitches are pretty much like typos in a book, or audiovisual distortions in films and movies. But what separates glitches from other mishaps in other medias is that glitches can actually be hilarious and highly entertaining. For entertainment purposes, game cartridge devices like GameShark and GameGenie have codes within to mimic glitches. For example, in Super Mario World 64 for the, well, the N64, there is a GameShark code already programmed in that will allow Mario to pretty much bend his back in a 90 degree angle and he's completely fine. I mean glitches like this is uh, pretty normal. I mean they're hilarious when they happen on their own but you can do these with game cartridge devices like uh, the Game Shark. It doesn't enhance the gameplay in a normal sense. So I'm just finding it amusing to see Mario run around in a way that's outside his norm. As I pretty much don't see another way to talk about the Game Shark in my other videos, I might as well go a little bit further in depth with it now. It's important to understand that it has other functions than just to visually screw up or mimic glitches within games. The Game Shark, as well as the Game Gene, is widely known in the video game community as both cheating devices. These devices can give you stuff like unlimited life and items, the ability to face through objects, give you more items on startup, things that you can't really get unless you played multiple times or, well, just play through the game normally. Using these devices like this does break immersion. Well, unless you want the immersion that you are a powerful god that can be hurt and everyone's just going to get wrecked when you come by. 
However, these devices can help with immersion. These devices can actually up the difficulty in ways that the game normally doesn't allow, and they can probably make it more realistic in that regards. It's possible to use these devices to make useful items pretty much gone outside of the game, or well, at least make them scarce. They can make other enemies harder. They can also make you weaker. They have the ability to make your character pretty much defenseless. Make the game more immersive in this way, because the character in the game is about the same physical ability as the person playing. But to be honest, I don't know really anybody that does this, or at least buys these devices for that reason. I believe it's good to point out that while it does make sense to have a character that has a normal physical ability, as well as live in a world with normal physics, it's very possible for a person to become immersed in a game while playing a character that has pretty much godlike abilities or is a cartoon that lives in a cartoon world with normal cartoon physics and properties. Then again, a good number of gamers want to be a badass, not be reminded of their limited ability and that they might not be able to live in a certain situation. Let's talk about death in video games for a second. Some games give you checkpoints. Now, checkpoints are when you die, you'll restart from right where you got the checkpoint. Maybe you got a checkpoint right before a big boss, and the boss whooped your butt. You died. Go right back to the beginning, right before you fought the boss. You could probably turn around, maybe get a little stronger, try to look for items that might help you defeat the boss or not. It doesn't really penalize you for a lot of games. I mean, you might lost a life that you might have accumulated, but that's about it. Very few games have done well with the game model that... You die once, and that's it. You go way right back to the start, and you have to go through the whole game again, no matter where you were, even if you were at the last boss. Talking about it this way it just pretty much makes it seem like it's a very bad game model. But it can prove to be very challenging, and a lot of people do like this model as it is a little bit more immersive. But now games pretty much have a save when you want models and checkpoint model. So, going back to this particular model where you die once and that's it, doesn't really uh, interest a lot of players. A lot of games can be really frustrating, really difficult, and having to restart right from the beginning, not something that a lot of people want to do, especially casual gamers. Now, having checkpoints, continues, and a set number of lives hinders immersion. But it isn't easy because not everybody has the same skill level. Implementing a die once that's a game model to all games would drop the number of gamers, as not many adults would have the patience to sit and play a game, knowing that once their health meter hits zero, that's the end of the game, and everything they did was for nothing. There's no point. I mean, especially for casual adult gamers, just, why would you? Not many adults would buy another game if they knew that they won't really get that far. And there's a good chance that a portion of the game they'll never see because they lack the skill and patience to replay the game until they finish. I know it would frustrate me to have to replay a game over and over again because maybe one part is really glitchy or a boss in the middle is too hard for me to figure out or, well, I don't have enough skill to beat. That's not to say that a model like this didn't already exist in a different form and actually worked. I mean, if you lost all three lives in the beginning of Super Mario Brothers for the Nintendo, you got a game over. And there wasn't a game save feature, so you couldn't just get to a save point, turn off the console, and come back to it later. Or for that fact, pick it up where you, where you left off. Nope, you had to either play the game from start to finish in one sitting, or leave the system on pause until you finished it, and hoping that no one would bump the system and make it freeze. Or you would have to take the game shortcut that they provide within game. I believe this is the reason why they had shortcuts in old video games. It's mostly because how is the casual player supposed to be able to beat a video game without save points or checkpoints or anything like that? Of course, later on, they would add password systems and stuff like that to help the more casual player get through a game. I'm going to just talk about uh, pretty much QTEs. QTEs are pretty much, well, what I said earlier, the quick time events, and uh, these require you to button press within a video game to... Uh, get a certain outcome, usually beneficial to your character, who's usually in mortal danger during these QTEs. Uh, I mean, some games take this model and pretty much run with it uh, the whole game. Like uh, Indigo Prophecy, it's all nothing but QTEs. Now, QTEs are something that uh, gamers, it's either a hit and a miss. Uh, some gamers like it, they make it feel a little more 
realistic that you're actually prying something open or prying something off. Um, I personally don't like QTEs. Uh, the first time I encountered QTE was in Resident Evil 4. Um, I thought, you know, hey, you know, it's a cutscene. I can just, like, sit down, maybe take a drink, uh, just relax. I mean, it's been a stressful game. Yeah, very fun, still stressful, and this is my little break. That's kind of the way I looked at cutscenes. Like, oh, I'm just going to get to see a little bit of a movie. But no, the QTs happened, my character died, and I'm sitting there like, oh, what? Like, I don't know what to do. And then you run into the problem where uh, there are certain people that can't do continuous, really quick button presses. So they're going to just keep dying at the cutscene. So this isn't really about skill of, like, analyzing your situation, uh, looking for a way around it, and continuing on, like mostly the rest of the gameplay is. It's mostly, uh, can you hit A really, really fast, and then there's something that's going to happen out of nowhere, then you're at the hold A, B, and then your character is going to dodge. But it's something you got to get around, and it's something that's in games now, and hopefully it'll die out. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. But I believe that's mostly because uh, gamers want to do the cool stuff they see in cutscenes, not just sit there and watch it. I mean, there's not really many ways to get around that either. It's either they give you QTE or you just sit there and watch and enjoy. But for games kind of like Metal Gear Solid 4, where a lot of people say it's pretty much an entire movie with little interactivity, having QTEs in there would actually help break up the monotonous of just sitting there watching. But at that point, you need to pretty much put it in the beginning of the cutscene and continue through the whole thing. So there's really no break where a person just sat there like, I'm just going to take a drink and take in the cutscene, get a little bit more of the information. Now you got to gotta either do something or do nothing. And it's uh, hard for developers to get you know that point across. Something that came along and actually helps with immersion is uh, the introduction of dialogue choices within video games. They're pretty much cutscenes themselves, but you are interacting. I mean, this does help uh, keep away from the QTEs, but the problem is that it will make the game longer. You will have to replay, which is not a bad thing. Uh, you get a choice to either be a a-hole or a really good person. This also makes it more immersive in the fact that you get to choose what your character is like, and you get the say what happens instead of like, oh, I'm playing this character that's goody two-shoes and he's doing things I wouldn't do, but I gotta do it anyways because it's part of the game, part of the story. But, you know, I like the games where you can make your own story, like Fallout and Deus Ex and stuff like that. Games that seem to do really well are games that where you can personalize your character and personalize what you do in the game. So, you know, when you talk to your friends, you can be like, well, my character did this. Like, in Mass Effect, my Shepard pretty much tried to save everybody. I mean, if I could, I didn't. I mean, I know for a fact that there are some people I know that didn't really care. I mean, if uh, they were an a-hole, they're gonna die. Even if uh, they were justifiably an a-hole, they're still gonna die. Which is fantastic. I mean, this model probably will show up a lot more. I mean, you can personalize the way your character looks, make it look like you, maybe. You can pretty much have a different story. I mean, it's great to know that my gameplay isn't exactly the same as someone else's, but to know that, like, key points I can probably get help on, but I got to choose what happened to my Shepard. I mean, it's great. Um, same thing with Fallout. I like that I try to make the Wasteland a better place, which makes video games so great. I mean, there's really no wrong way to play a video game besides, you know, if you get killed. That's pretty much it. I mean, if the game has parameters that you can fail, that's the only other way. I mean, it's not going to tell you, no, you're wrong for killing all those people. But it also doesn't make you a serial killer because you killed a bunch of people in a video game. That's something that's got to be distinguished, but um, you can get immersed in a world where you did kill a whole town, like by setting off a nuclear bomb, but it doesn't mean that you're an actual person that would, but it gives you the freedom to do something that you normally wouldn't do. I believe being able to make your own character does make a game a little bit more immersive and a little bit more personal, but it's not to say that it's the only way to get, you know, immersed in a video game. I mean, a lot of people who play, like, Mario Galaxy can probably get, like, really into it and make it really personal because of what you did in the game and how you did it and if you found a shortcut or not that's not actually supposed to be in the game. I mean, these are certain things that will immerse you and make you remember your situation within a video game and Hopefully make you come back, maybe buy sequels, and 
care about the world and feel its plight and want to actually help the world. Instead of like, oh, now the game just make me do this and I better go do it because I want to finish the game. That's pretty much all I can say about uh, immersion in video games. I'm going to have more people on later. Uh, some guests, some people I know that also play some of the games I did. Um, I know that some of them play them differently than I do and have a different perspective on video games. So it'll be good to see how other people treat video games. Uh, I'll keep this uh, channel running, um, put more videos on it, maybe do a different format, maybe actual video instead of uh, this cartoon stuff. I just thought it'd be easier, which turns out it's not. So um, please support, subscribe, uh, more videos to come. So tune in, and I'll see you next time. Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, please leave a comment below. Uh, I pretty much open to any suggestions to make it better. Always glad to hear any feedback, uh, as long as it's not completely too negative, with no constructive uh, criticism. Um, thank you again, and I'll see you next time.